Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about visualizing demographic learning and attitudinal results. And we're going to do this by looking at some examples of tables and figures from past students. So let's get started. First up, we have demographic data. Here you can see a simple APA style table entitled Participant Characteristics. And notice that it says N equals 15. This is useful because the reader knows right away that the data in the table is based on a sample size of 15 participants. Now the table itself has four columns. We have the characteristics themselves, gender, age, and frequency of internet use. And then in the next column over, we have the subcategories for each of those characteristics. For example, gender has two subcategories, male and female, and age has two subcategories as well. Moving to the right, we can see two more columns, which list the N or sample size, and then the percent of the total. This is a nice, easy to read table. And notice that there's no vertical border lines used. There's only horizontal lines, and that's to adhere to APA style formatting. Here's a variation of a demographic table. It is titled Participant Gender, Age, Education, and Employment Level, and N equals 15. Again, we see four columns with the main demographic characteristics followed by the subcategories, and then the number and percent. The table is clean and easy to read. There are implied vertical lines and very few horizontal lines. But what's unique about this table is that for each characteristic, you'll notice that one row of data is in bold font. That is meant to signify that that particular subcategory of the characteristic is the one with the highest number of participants in it. This is a way to make it easy for readers to scan through the table and easily find the most popular responses within a demographic category. If I was going to level one criticism of this particular table, I would argue that the decimal points in the percent column are unnecessary. It's better to round up to the nearest whole number, and this would make for less text and just make the table a little bit easier to read. Now, here's another example. It's a pie chart, and it's titled Participants Academic Major by College. For this particular project, it was argued that the participants major might be important, and so the demographic survey collected that information. And the pie chart makes it really easy to discern that 27% of the participants majored in art, languages, and letters, 20% in education, and another 20% in natural sciences. Don't overdo it with pie charts, but occasionally they can be a useful approach to visualizing demographic data. Now, sometimes you might want to use a bar chart to display demographic data. In this particular example, we could see how many years participants have taught elementary education. The y-axis of the chart represents the number of participants, and the x-axis has categories for number of years. The bar chart makes it really easy to see that the tallest bar, at 42%, had 5 to 10 years of experience. And the next biggest group was 25% at 10 to 20 years of experience. Now, one critique of this particular chart is the absence of an overall sample size. In other words, anyone looking at this chart won't know how many participants 42 represents. 42% of what? Because it's a master's project, we can probably guess that it's 15. But ideally, that information should be presented in the chart itself. Here's another example using a horizontal bar chart. It is about participants' self-reported training frequency. The chart's y-axis shows categories of training frequencies, and the x-axis shows the number of participants. The longer the bar, the more people fell into that category. In this case, it seems the participants were somewhat dispersed in terms of their training frequency, which was likely relevant to their perception of the instructional module used in this project. There may be times when you want to slice your demographic data. So what does that mean? Well, that means taking all of your participants and slicing or splitting them into subcategories. In this first example, we're slicing the demographic data by one category, prior library instruction. The title of this horizontal bar chart is Participants Self-Report of Prior Library Instruction. And we can see the sample size is equal to 15. 
Well, the chart tells us four of those 15 participants said yes, they do had prior library instruction. However, eight of them said no, and three said they weren't sure. This is an example of slicing all participants by one category, which we've seen plenty of times before. Now, this next example takes things a bit further because it slices the demographic data by two categories. The chart is titled Participants by Age and Highest Level of Education Completed. This means the participants will be categorized based on two characteristics, their age and level of education. As a result, each horizontal bar in the chart tells us how many participants fell into that one age category, and then within that category, what the highest level of education completed was for those specific participants. Obviously, color coding and a clearly labeled legend are important for more complex visualizations like this one. But this is a nice example of conveying a lot of information using a single figure. So what about learning data? Well, most of you are going to have pre and post test scores, and that means you're probably going to want to compare those scores. So here's an example of how to do that in a table. As you can see, the results are broken down by module. So there's module one, module two, and module three. And for each of those modules, we have a pre-test score and a post-test score. For example, if we look at module one, the pre-test score was 65% but the post-test score was 84%. And in the rightmost column, we also have the difference or delta being reported. That's what that triangle symbol means. This makes it easy to discern that there was a 19% difference between the pretest and the post-test scores related to module one. This is done for all of the modules, and then in the bottom row, there is an average for all three modules combined. This table is super easy to interpret, it's clean, and uses only horizontal lines to adhere to APA style. Here's another example that's also using a table. But what's different about this one is that it's actually breaking down the results by individual questions. So we could see Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. So rather than rolling all of those up into a lesson or module scores, readers can see the changes at the individual question level. And just like before, the last row provides an average score for all nine questions. This is the same idea as breaking pre- and post-test scores down by module, but this example provides a little bit more detail. Sticking with learning data, here's an example using a figure instead of a table. In this case, it is a vertical bar chart with two data series, one for pre-test scores and one for post-test scores. The chart is titled Participants Average Pretest and Post-Test Score by Module. The sample size is 17, and the chart's y-axis is labeled percent correct, and the x-axis has categories, one for each module. There are clearly four modules, and the rightmost bars represent the average learning that occurred across all four modules combined. As you can see, bar charts make it really easy for readers to tell whether or not there was a difference between the pretest and post-test scores. In this case, we can see module one increased, module two really increased, whereas module three actually dropped a little bit, which is surprising, and module four didn't seem to change much at all. This is a nice way to show readers pre and post-test scores. Here's another example of using a vertical bar chart with two series. Again, it's showcasing average participant pre- and post-test scores by module. However, what's different is explicit labeling of the difference between the two bars. In this case, Allison modified the bar chart such that the delta, or the amount of chains, was actually labeled for each comparison. This is a nice touch because it is essentially doing the math for the readers. It makes it easy for them to understand the magnitude of the difference between the scores for each of the modules. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about attitudinal data. In this example, we can see a table titled Participants Post-Instruction Comments About Place-Based Learning by Category. The sample size is 19, and essentially, this table is showing the results of open-ended comments left by participants. Those comments have been analyzed and categorized by implementation, motivation, engagement, relevant, relevance, and challenges. The table has three columns, total number of comments, positive comments, and negative comments. 
In total, there were 20 comments and 95% of them were positive and 5% of them were negative. We've seen similar tables representing other kinds of open-ended data. Here's another example where we're analyzing media ratings related to the designer's instructional decisions. Looks like this data was captured using Likert scale items. For example, the first statement was, the videos were interesting and relevant to the content. So how did participants rate that item? Well, the four number summary makes it really easy for us to know. On a five point scale, the average was 4.88. And we can also see the standard deviation as well as the minimum and maximum values. This table also includes a useful note at the bottom explaining the Likert scale used. Now, here's another example involving retrospective data. In this case, participants were asked to rate their level of agreement with several statements about the learning module. Again, we see a four number summary and it's very easy to read. A table like this is a nice clean way to display retrospective results. Now, here's another interesting example. This chart is titled Average Overall Retrospective Survey Ratings Organized by the ARCS Categories. Of course, ARCS stands for Attention, Relevance, Confidence, and Satisfaction. And the responses to those items were actually entered using a six-point scale. Using color coding, it is easy to compare the before and after scores for each area of the ARCS model. We can quickly tell that relevance seems to be the component that changed the most and satisfaction the least. The takeaway here is that a vertical bar chart with two series can be a great way to showcase retrospective ratings. So there you have it, folks. Lots of different examples of how to visualize demographic learning and attitudinal data using tables and figures. Thanks for watching.